Welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm your host, Tim Moore, and I'm joined by my co-host, Nathan Jones. Our Jesus in the Old Testament series is spending a second week in the book of Psalms, a book that could be the focus of many episodes. In fact, we have dedicated entire episodes of Christ in Prophecy and published pamphlets to focus on single chapters of this wonderful book. The Psalms capture the confession and adoration that is at the heart of Jewish worship. We lose some of the cadence and flow of the original Hebrew poetry and translation, but thankfully the gifted men and women who translated God's word into English endeavored to capture its beauty and musical quality in our own language. Several Psalms have obvious messianic overtones. Psalm 2 says that God laughs as the kings of the earth take their stand against Him and His anointed, and warns us all to do homage to the Son, lest we perish in the way when His wrath is kindled. As Jesus hung on the cross, he cited Psalm 22 from the opening anguish lament, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To the final verse, He has performed it, or it is finished. And when the Jewish people ascended to Jerusalem to observe the Passover each year, they sang the pilgrim Song of Ascent, which is Psalm 120 through 134. Many of the Psalms were written by David, while others were written by Solomon, Asaph, the sons of Korah, and other named authors. Several are anonymous. But whether they express adoration of God, confession of a contrite heart, or the pain of suffering and desperation, all the songs are expressive of a heart wholly devoted to the Lord. Which is why we can rightfully say, when our hearts are full, then sings my soul. There are many gifted singers whose voices make a truly joyful noise to the Lord, and others who are anointed writers who can put into words what our heart can hardly convey. And yet it takes a special gift to lead people into worship, taking them into the very throne room of God. Several years ago, I met a very gifted worship leader who was serving at a church in Louisville, Kentucky. Joe Kreider was the lead worship pastor there at Highview Baptist Church, and he now is here at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Joe is the Dean and Professor of the School of Church Music and Worship, and I'm delighted to sit down with him. Joe, you truly do have a gift, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Thanks, Tim. It's an honor to be here with you. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, your, your ability to lead not only individuals, but corporate bodies of Christ into the throne room of God was such a tremendous blessing to me and my family. I'm reminded of the power of music, and I even found a quote from 1697, uh, an author by the name of William Congreve fend a very famous, famous line in an almost forgotten poem. He said, music has charms to soothe a savage breast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people nowadays think it's to soothe a savage beast, but really the idea that music mm -hmm. can convey emotions and ideas and beauty mm -hmm. that sometimes we can hardly put into words. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the power of music cannot go, uh, it, it's, it's hard to overstate the power of music. And um, while that is absolutely core in, in realizing music's power, <clears throat> I think it's also an interesting reality. And it's unusual for the dean of a school of music to say something like this, but I don't think the God of the triune God of the universe um, ever intended for us to gather specifically around music. Uh, because music changes so frequently with culture. Mm -hmm. Music changes so much with, with people's individual tastes. And, and, and unfortunately, that's where the church has begun to separate herself in, within congregations based on styles of music. Yes. I think God called us to gather around Jesus Christ who never changes Amen. and His Word that never returns void. And when we do that, and we sing together, the music, I think, becomes even that much more important because it's pointing people to Jesus. It's pointing people to His Word. Amen. And it becomes a vehicle. Just recently in our Jesus in the Old Testament series, of mm -hmm. course, we went through the book of Job, and yes. many of you have, were a part of that. And in one of the earliest books of the Bible, in terms of the historical narrative of this man's life, God asks, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? And He said that when that occurred, when He laid the foundations of the heavens and the earth, the morning stars sang Same. together That's and right. all the sons of God shouted for joy. The idea that lyrical praise burst from our hearts at moments of worship 
is absolutely biblical. That's exactly right. And, and the, the amazing aspect of this is, is that music, God's gift to us through the gift of music, is what affords our congregations <clears throat> that one voice of response not to a particular sound or not to a particular leader or not to a particular instrument, but a res it affords us the ability to articulate together mm. in one moment, at one time, in a beautiful way, our response to Jesus in worship. Amen. And when that happens, we begin to realize the power of music. I, because I'll tell you, Tim, people don't usually leave Sunday mornings singing the sermon, <laughs> but no. boy, they leave singing the songs. Uh, and yes, sir. That's why music's so important because the the truths of the Word of God, the truths of of who Christ is and who we are, really are 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 lifted into the congregation on the wings of music, into the minds and the hearts of believers for them to respond to Jesus. And Amen. That's a great thing. I think also you, you mentioned something about the harmony that happens. And so God being triune, I mean, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are in perfect harmony. Yes. And so when our voices blend together and <laughs> harmonize, and let's face it, some of us are, are gifted and some of us have to get a bucket to try to catch and carry a tune. Yes. But when we blend our voices together, then I think we are, are capturing the very essence of where we should be in that relationship with God, which is focused on Him, worshiping Christ, and doing it corporately. You know, the title that we've given to this episode is, Then Sings My Soul, a mm -hmm. phrase that acts as a bridge in the great hymn, How Great Thou Art. Sure. And that hymn was made famous by George Beverly Shea, mm -hmm. who sang at every Billy Graham crusade That's for right. many, many years. But the song itself, the hymn, actually came to America from Sweden by way of Germany and Russia. Mm -hmm. And the famous third verse, which I love and we'll put on the screen, was written by Stuart Hine, but it was transcribed quite frankly and literally from the heartfelt confessions of Ukrainian Christians mm -hmm. as they praise the Lord. So even yes. this great hymn comes from a, a variety of yes. backgrounds and sources and we still, it touches my heart every time I sing that great hymn. Amen. Amen. That's a that's an incredible story and an incredibly appropriate for for today, isn't it? As yes, we sir. think about the Ukrainian believers. And another thing you just said, Tim, that I think is so powerful, when you talked about the idea of our triune God, there's a a wonderful theologian and uh, philosopher and musician, professional mus musician named Jeremy Begbie. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy Begbie is um, one of the things that he does is he uses. He, as, he, as he talks about the deep truths of theology, he'll use music to help explain theology, music to help um, enlighten our understanding of theology. And even the idea of the Trinity, the art of music is, is, that, is that perhaps one of the, the few places in the arts where you see the, the idea of the Trinity that three notes can take the same space Remain their, retain their individuality, but join into a beautiful chord. Yes. And you can't do that with colors no. because you combine yellow and red and, green and you get a different color. Yeah. But in, in music, it's different. There is something very powerful about music. I've never thought about the chord as a demonstration of the beauty and, and the wonder of God. It, that, that's a great illustration, Joe. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I will use that again. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I'll remember to give you credit, but... Uh, <laughs> we'll give Jeremy Baby credit. <laughs> okay, I'll give the Lord God credit <laughs> because the Holy that's Spirit good. probably laid it on His heart. That's you good. know, many Christians today, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned styles of music and mm -hmm. taste, but, but there is a reality that, that many Christians have expressed concern over preaching that is shallow too mm -hmm. often yes. and avoids the full counsel of God. That's, That's something right. we talk about. We, we talk you know, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all the Word of God. But similarly too, sometimes Christian worship has devolved to trite, uh, repetitive choruses devoid mm -hmm. of, of real biblical truth. And so there are hymn writers, you mentioned one, who still convey deep truths in their songs, in their music, like Keith and Kristen mm -hmm. Getty. Uh, they have truly a gift. How can we ensure that our churches are not only raising a joyful noise before the Lord, but they are teaching new generations of Christians the doctrine 
of the faith, even as we exalt our soon returning King? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, Tim. And it's a question that we are constantly putting in front of our students Good. because of, of the absolute necessity. At the end of the day, our times of worship um, are really, if you ask the question, what's at stake on Sunday mornings? And I think the answer to that question in a simplistic way is people's view of who God is, people's understanding of who Jesus is and people's understanding of who they are. And in a world that is, is mediated and saturated by social media and, and all, of the other, all of the other ways that people get views of God that are not accurate, we, we don't have time on Sunday mornings other than to be ex- expressly biblical in what we do. Yes. And, and I tell our, our, we tell our worship students, we tell our, our majors who are, who are going to be worship leaders and, and worship pastors, <clears throat> their role is to facilitate a potentially life-changing dialogue between the triune God of the universe and his redeemed. Mm -hmm. And as God (laughs) reveals himself to us, he reveals himself most specifically through the word of God. And therefore, as we sing, as we pray, as we even make transition statements between songs, what we're doing is forming and shaping people's ideas of who God is, Mm and their ideas of who themselves. It's spiritual formation. And therefore, our, the text of our hymns absolutely must be clearly and, and, and devotedly committed to the accuracy of the Word of God and to the, using the rubric of Scripture so that we're singing right doctrine and right theology. And there's some wonderful new hymn writers. There are. There, the Gettys, Matt Boswell, um, Matt Papa, City of Light, um, David Aubrey, with Stored in My Heart Ministries. Um, they're, they're just wonderful groups now that are taking seriously Shane and Shane, taking seriously the authority of the Word of God in their songwriting. I absolutely agree, and amen. I'm grateful for folks like that who have been anointed with a gift of That's music. Right. And you know, there's something beautiful about music getting deep into our, our spirit, our soul. Uh, I think about Miss Ann Reagan, Dr. Reagan's wife, who uh, has since gone to be with the Lord, but she had a form of dementia. And yet when I would visit her with Dr. Reagan, I could sing hymns and it would pull her back out because she had a deep recollection of how that music had impacted her. And, and hymns that reflect biblical truth and are set to anointed music have the ability, again, to pierce our heart and touch our spirits. Joe, what are some of your favorite psalms that tend to do that? You know, I, I think that um, so many hymn writers, and especially Isaac Watts, mm. uh, basically, um, as, we, as we sometimes say, Christianized the psalms in, in his hymns and, and the ways that he, he brought, brought Christ to the forefront in, in the Psalms. But, but we, we realized that even in the early days of, of the Reformation, somebody like uh, you know, John Calvin had the entire Psalter set metrically to songs. And, and because he felt like the, the only thing that was worthy of God's praise in the congregation was the Word of God itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for, for many, many, many years, uh, the Psalter is, is what was sung. And, and we're, we're finding, I think, a, a resurgence in psalm singing. Yes. And, and th- that's, it's a powerful thing because we realize that what we're singing is wonderfully clear. It's wonderfully accurate. And not only the psalms that are, are psalms of praise, like Psalm 150, but even psalms that are psalms more of a lament. Uh, there's a, a, a rather modern uh, song that's based on Psalm 13. And if you look at Psalm 13, it, it has the 
it's, it's the question, how long, Lord, will mm. you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face? And at the end of this, at the end of this psalm, but I have trusted in your yeah. faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me generously. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the Psalms <clears throat> give us the language of our praise. Yes, they they give us the vocabulary of our praise. They give us the grammar of our praise. And great songwriters, great hymn writers, are the ones that dive deeply into the Psalms because the Psalms are the are are so much not only the fabric, <clears throat> but also in a wonderful way the resource for for such great hymnody. And well, uh, what a joy that is to be able to sing the Psalms. Psalm 13 fits so beautifully even with our ministry because one of our daily prayers is Maranatha, and so one of the questions is, "How long, O Lord? Yes. How long do we yes. have to wait?" And yes. yet. Even as he tarries, the concluding verse uh, or verses, <laughs> while I wait, I will trust in you. And, and so it really captures so much of, of what my own personal praise would be about. Joe, I've mentioned already, and, and you have, so many of the, the songs in the Psalms the, the, that were written by David and Asaph and Solomon, sure. the sons mm -hmm. of Korah and others. And Moses, uh, that's right. Yes, and Moses. Are purely worshipful while others are, as you said, confessional. And scholars like yourself, I know, would categorize them into seven major types lament, yes. thanksgiving, mm -hmm. enthronement, pilgrimage, royal, wisdom, and imprecatory, those that seek justice by calling down God's judgment on his enemies. I, I wish I had the gift of writing music. Mm -hmm. I, I try to write, I've done a little poetry, but I think it is a special gift. But within the sweep of human emotion, where do you see in the Psalms signposts that point to the Messiah or even evidence of Jesus himself within the Psalms? You know, that, that's, a great, that's a great question as well. And I think <clears throat> I, was, I was having a conversation with Dr. Wills <clears throat> one day, the, the dean of the School of Theology here. And, and he made a, 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 a comment, he was being funny, but he, he was saying that, <clears throat> that the Psalms are really a New Testament book. <laughs> and now, <laughs> yeah. we, we understand what he was meaning by sure. that. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is throughout the entire Psalter. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just think of Psalm 22. Yeah. My God, my God, why have you yes. abandoned me? Why are you so far from del my deliverance? The words that Jesus used on the cross, right? <sighs> Amen. And there are, as we, as we look at the Psalms, through, through the lens of Christ, through the lens of who He is, I think the Psalter becomes alive. I think, I think, the, I think the Psalter has even more, um, more connection to our own, to our own lives. But, but here's the interesting, the, the early patristic fathers, the Athanasius, and they, they were, they were, uh, they wrote prolifically about the power of the Psalms, that there's not a human emotion, there's not a human activity, there's not, there's not anything in human life that we face or that we, we go through that in some way is not articulated beautifully in the Psalms. Amen. And, and, and I, I am hoping that more and more our churches Will, will allow the Word of God to penetrate and saturate their services by simply reading the Psalms and singing the Psalms because they, they do connect with people on ways, in ways that, that, that we could never have orchestrated, that only the Spirit of God through His perfect Word does that. He certainly does. And I advocate not only praying the Psalms, singing the Psalms, but uh, using them as a source of, of daily Bible study and devotion. Amen. Uh, you know, Joe, during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, as some call it, over the last couple of years, some very heavy handed uh, governors and government officials sought to specifically silence Christian congregations. But as our title suggests, the very heart of a Christian is tuned to the Lord in a way that we cannot help but burst out in song. Mm -hmm. And so 
How really nefarious was that effort to try to undermine corporate Christian worship? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that, that you mentioned that. Uh, I, have, I have a Chinese student, a THM student right now, and her father works specifically with the persecuted house church in China. Mm. And she's doing her THM uh, thesis utilizing the book of Hebrews as, as a guide for persecuted churches in China to, to sing through and worship through persecution. Wow. And to gather through persecution. In the essential nature of the corporate gathering, vital to the life of the believer. And, and I, I can't think of anything that's more important for us to gather on, that, on the Lord's Day to recalibrate our minds and our hearts to what's really real, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and we do that intentionally, and that's why the Word is so important. And I'm so grateful that before the foundations of the world were laid, that, that God knew in our rhythms of life every seven days we would need to gather we would need to encourage one another we would need to hear the word we would need to hear each other sing yes sing the truths of and i've heard people say well I, I i can just study at home and i tell them really how can you encourage others that's right if you don't go and be a part that's someone right. needs the encouragement you that's would have right. to offer and to, to lean on one another well joe what song do you think our songs i don't know best captures the joy of anticipating Jesus' soon return? Oh boy, I, I have people ask me of, you know, questions of, of, of that. Um, uh, you know, the How Great Thou Art, I, I, th I think uh, is, a, is a powerful um, reality of that. Um, I, also, I also am I'm impressed with, with newer hymn writers who are looking forward to that day of Christ's return as well. Yes. Um, we, we sing uh, a, a newer hymn, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. And there is a looking forward to that day. Uh, in Christ Alone, yes. the great Getty hymn, mm -hmm. there's a looking forward to that day. Um, so, and I could go through several older hymns as well because you see the progression of thought uh, in those of, of the reality that yes, He will return. And, um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm grateful for the, for the hymn writers that look forward. They realize Christ's presence in our <clears throat> lives now. They look at the past and see His faithfulness, but we also look forward to the future. Always so, looking forward. I, right. I think of great hymns like Joy to the World or the Hallelujah Chorus. Sure. You know, that hearken <clears throat> to the first advent, but really in both cases are pointing to the glorious second Absolutely. coming. Absolutely. Well, Joe, your, your heart of worship is one that has, has touched my life, my family's life, countless others, now students. So, Dr. Joe Kreider, <laughs> thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. I pray the Lord's blessing continues to flow, not just on you, but through you to lives that uh, will impact the kingdom of God. Thank you, Tim. And may the same be said for your ministry. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you, sir. All right. Godspeed. David was called a man after God's own heart. In spite of his shortcomings, he was tuned to worship the Lord, which is why Jesus said that the mouth of a good man speaks from that which fills his heart. Lest the very rocks cry out, how better to express our praise than in joyful song? Joe Kreider has written a wonderful book called Scripture Guided Worship. It calls for readers to think rightfully about God based on what He has revealed about Himself in His Word, the Bible. Since worship is the act and activity of responding to, praising, and glorifying God, it is vital that we worship in spirit and in truth. With that in mind, I'd encourage you to utilize the Psalms as a means of prayerful worship. Dr. Donald Whitney offers this helpful suggestion in his book, Praying the Bible. On each day of the month, 
consider the psalm corresponding to that day. So on the first of the month, go to Psalm 1. If that psalm does not resonate at that moment, go to Psalm 31 or 61 or 91 or 121. I've done that for many months and can testify that one of the psalms corresponding to a given day of the month always touches my heart and offers me words to raise up in prayerful worship to the Lord. If you know a tune, sing the psalm. If you don't, allow the Holy Spirit-inspired words of David and the other psalmists to usher your spirit into the courts of the Almighty. This method of praying through the Bible will offer a new way for the psalms to bless your heart and allow you to glorify God with words He first revealed in the hearts of men, inspired to write the very Word of God. Well, Tim, there is so much could be said and sung about the Psalms. You're absolutely right. But thankfully, God has raised up Christian men and women who have been able to put His Word to music and others who have written beautiful hymns that reflect biblical truths. Well, I love the idea of worshiping the Lord in song and in prayer by reciting His own Word back to Him. You know, on that note, can you imagine me writing 150 songs or poems about me and giving it to my wife as a gift and saying, go ahead and, and recite these to me and it will bless your heart. She'd think I was a complete narcissist. But because God is God, His 150 psalms are an absolute blessing to us because they allow us to rightfully express praise to Him. And we could spend a week on each of the psalms, offering 150 episodes to impact the significance of each one. Well, in our application segment, Tim implied that different psalms resonate in our individual hearts differently. And we know that's true and that at different times, various psalms express our own thoughts and emotions as we seek to worship the Lord. Several of the psalms are particularly messianic, as we mentioned in our introduction. With that in mind, we have a special offer today, a combination of both a DVD and a wonderful Insights publication focusing on Psalm 2. For a gift of $15 or more, we'll be glad to ship these powerful resources to you. You'll be richly blessed as Dr. David Reagan explains the messianic significance of this prophetic psalm. In the words of the last verse in Psalm 2, you'll be inspired to do homage to the Son, for His wrath may soon be kindled, and come to understand how blessed are all who take refuge in Him. We will return to the Psalms in future episodes of Christ and Prophecy because there are so many gems to be mined in this rich book. We'd encourage you to select a key verse or two as you reflect on the Psalms that have been special to you. Ours for today is the last verse in the book, Psalm 156. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, until next week, this is Nathan Jones. And Tim Moore saying, look up and be watchful for our Lord, who is worthy to be praised, is drawing near. Thank you.